Mr. Eddie Hearn of Matchroom Boxing, and he's kind enough to join us. Lord knows where he is right now. Hello, Eddie. How are you? Where, what is the play, by the way? Are we staying in San Fran? Are we going to L.A.? Are we going to Phoenix? Because no. you got the show. What's the play? Yeah, I'm, we're in Los Angeles uh, today. We've actually, I might as well tell you anyway, we've got some good news. We're, we're going to be opening our own gym later in Los Angeles, Matchroom Gym. Wow. With uh, Pete Berg and Churchill. That was, I've just really broke the, the uh, press release that's coming in a few hours, but... We're heading there today. We want a base for our global fight uh, roster to be able to train over here in America. And we've got our own little gym, which is going to be nice. So we're down there with the media later today. So we're in Los Angeles. That's our breaking news thank music. You. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that. And uh, yeah, then we head up to Phoenix tomorrow for the big unification fight. So it's been a great run. Of course, Devin, last week, sunny against Bam this weekend, and then off to Saudi Arabia to finish it all off December 23rd. Okay, what a stretch. But uh, first, can I ask, is, is this the first official matchroom gym? Yeah, there's a matchroom gym in the UK as well. But it's, it's really uh, the Tony Sims's fighters that we kind of started a, a while back. But this is really the first time that we've ventured out uh, outside of the UK with our gym. Just important for us, you know, obviously, with our roster of events worldwide, we just wanted some kind of base in America for our fighters to be able to train kind of an elite training facility, you know, not quite to the levels of, of the UFC yet, but just a good gym that we can base our fighters in. They can get top sparring while they're here. And, and yeah, we'll, we'll officially announce today. I love that. Well, congratulations. And, and thanks for breaking the news here. We know we love that as well. Um, obviously we're, we're all at times sort of like victims of the moment, but if you could take a step back, Cameron Taylor in Dublin, then Northern Ireland, uh, for Mick Conlon, unfortunately, it didn't go his way. Then this past weekend in San Francisco, then the Arizona fight, as you mentioned, uh, Sonny against Bam, and then Riyadh. I mean, has there been a better five, six-week stretch in your career? I, I don't think so. I mean, I think, you know, we live in a world of just 110 miles an hour at all time, no breaks. So you never really get the chance to sit back and look at the schedule in the moments. I mean, Katie's victory against Chantel was, you know, arguably fight of the year. The, the atmosphere that we saw there was incredible. Um, Belfast again you know although it didn't go Conlon's way but a stunning upset and then San Francisco last weekend was wild you know they haven't had a big fight in over two decades so to go there and see Devin who sometimes has got criticised in the past for not being able to sell that's generally what happens when you're really good someone uses that as a kind of excuse not to fight you now you're taking that away and Sonny against Bam you know it's a, it's a it's a fight fans fight you know I think if you ask the hardcore fight fans they put that up there as one of their fights of the year and then Saudi's obscene. You know, His Excellency Turkey Al Sheikh just put something together that no one could ever do. No one could even dream of putting a card like that top to bottom. He's probably got four fights too many you know, on a card. That's probably a, a, a run of fights on that show that you could use over a six-month period of your, your schedule. Do you know what I mean? Right. And he's doing it all on one night. So, yeah, I don't, you know, we felt that our first six months was not slow, but not as good as PBC particularly. So we put a lot of effort into this back half of the schedule, and I think particularly from you know, August, September, it's just been incredible. Uh, is that something where you sit back and tell the team, I just didn't feel like the first six months were good enough, we need to we need to end the year on a better note? Like, w Was that like a personal challenge to everyone involved? Yeah, I think we like, you know, I think help, competition's great. You know, I, I like to win, obviously, and I like to try and be number one. And I know what we're doing globally is one thing, but we were definitely behind the eight ball you know, for that first half of the year. And, and our run at the back end of last year was so impressive. And I don't like it when people say so-and-so's got a better schedule than you. You know, you have to remember, when we came to America, particularly, what, four years ago, we were trying to sell the dream to fighters about this new app that was going to be the global home of boxing. And you imagine, Ariel, you know, I remember sitting down with Mikey Garcia in, uh, I think it was in LA, actually, when we first launched. And I was, like, trying to convince him to sign with Matram and DAZN. And he was like, so what is this design thing? What, so how does this app thing work? You know, and it was really difficult to really get the fighters to buy into what we were trying to do four years on. You know, I mean, the, you know, the schedule is unbelievable. Obviously, you've got Riyadh coming up, just had Devin. You've got Jake Paul on a Friday night this week. I just feel like they've done such a great job along with us. And they're in a great place from a you know financial and a numbers position in boxing. So it's taken a long time, but. You know, for us, we just want to put the best schedule together all the time. We just want to win all the time. It doesn't always play out like that, but there's definitely been a big push from myself and the team 
to end this year strong. Uh, when you find out that PBC is signed with Amazon, and I think there's another part of that deal too to come, uh, meaning that they'll have another home as well. Does that does that you know give you the little you know competitive spirit kick in again? Like okay, now now we're up against Actually, Amazon. It, I'm pleased. You know, and a lot of people said, "Oh, did you wish they didn't find a home?" No, of course not. You know, it's a new broadcaster coming in, a powerful platform that shows you the value of boxing. You know, we, we don't want no customers in boxing. We want as many broadcasters as possible in the sport. It pushes us, it pushes DAZN, it pushes ESPN to to be competitive and try and outperform the competition. So I don't know, you know, I believe it's a revenue share deal and that's probably why they'll need another home as well for their consistent content. But it would be a disaster if PBC didn't find a home. You know, they're a very good uh, promotional company. They're, They're a strong brand. They have tremendous fighters. And we need to make sure that all of these fighters have a home and you know to bring a new broadcaster in i just think it shows you the way live sport is transitioning from you know the, the traditional linear into digital space and we saw that many years ago and now you're seeing it you know even more so now with a traditional cable outlet in showtime withdrawing from the sport and a new streaming platform coming in in amazon so i think all in all great for the sport Tremendous Eddie Hearn impression by both uh, Bill Haney and Devin Haney at the post-fight press conference on Saturday. Is it true you were thinking around 7,000 tickets in the end? I think it was over 16,000. Is that what you were yeah, shooting I, for? You know what? It's like I keep when we came to America, I felt like there was so much potential in big sports cities that haven't been hosting boxing for some time. But there's no analytics. There's no data that can give you the confidence to go there versus a gate in Las Vegas or versus a gate in New York. So here you've got the Bay Area, where Devin's from. You know, we've got a fantastic arena in the Chase Center. You know, the home of the Warriors. They've got a huge database. They've got a huge commercial presence in the city. Ugh, it should work. But do you really want to make these guarantees to all the fighters on the basis that you're going to hit, you know, I don't know, a, a eight or 9,000 gate? And, and we haven't seen that before. So to do 16,000 was incredible. It was great for US boxing, I think, that, you know, a new star coming in can fill up arenas in not a random city, but one that isn't a consistent host for boxing. So, you know, for Devin's career as well, it was a fantastic look because now you're looking at the other mega fights and you, you know, he's got the ammunition to say, look, I just sold out San Francisco. You know, we can do it in Vegas. We can do it in New York. And, you know, you know now this kid can, can sell at the gate. I said to you, I think when we were in Dublin, that I don't believe that you are the one running your social media just because there's so much activity coming off that thing. And so I don't know if you actually saw this clip or if your assistant retweeted it. But last week on the show, Regis Progre said that he thought that you wanted him to lose, uh, that uh, Devin was your guy. And so could I ask, was that true? And are you happy that Devin beat him on Saturday? You know, I've got a long, long relationship with Devin. I mean, we took a, a punt on him about four years ago when no one else really saw the, the the potential that he had in and out of the ring. And we had a great run. You know, we always dreamt that he would become our first undisputed champion for America. We got frozen out in a deal with Lou DiBella and, and Bob Aaron. We know the game, it's no problem. But he didn't want to take that deal. But in the end, it was the only way he could get his shot undisputed was to sign that three-fight contract. And he promised me he'd be back. And he came back. He was true to his word. So I've got a history with him. But at the same time, with Regis... I flew in, I signed him, I said to him, I promise you, one fight, homecoming, and then a mega fight. And we we delivered both. You know, he, I thought he responded fantastically well post-fight, very honest assessment of this kid's just too good. You know, I couldn't have trained harder, I couldn't have done any more, but I was just beaten by, you know, probably a generational talent in there. So, yeah, I, I don't like having two guys in a fight or two girls in a fight because I like to scream and shout and, you know, you can't really do it. It's like when Katie boxed Chantel Cameron, calls her. How can I disguise my journey with with Katie Taylor? It's been life changing, you know. And but you can't, you know. And it's not. I'm not even screaming inside. I'm, you're almost dead to it. But you know, I was pleased for Devin, and I was pleased for Regis to get his moment. But you know, this kid is very special. What impressed you most about Devin on Saturday? Just like his his composure. I mean, firstly, he hardly broke sweat. You know. Um, I worried there was a lot of build up for that week. He was out all week doing promotional activity, the homecoming, you know, all of a sudden you walk out, you've got 16,000 of your own there. Like I, I wondered if that would play a, take a toll on him, but not, not at all. And this is why I think this kid's more and more impressive all the time. You know, I do think his work ethic is almost unrivaled, you know, and you saw that, that extra weight, even five pounds 
makes a huge difference to him. He was broken at 135. And I do think you'll end up seeing him go to 47, but just so difficult to hit, so skillful, so composed, so calm. He's punching harder at 140. I think he's going to be more robust. His engine, you know, he's he's really, really, really good. I'm not. I don't really see anybody at 140 that can be him. Okay, so if it was up to you, if if there were no politics involved, and you could just make the fight, so many options at 140. Names like Garcia, Lopez, Catterall thrown out. Who's your top choice for him next? I mean, you know, if we're talking, you, you said a key word there: politics. To yeah. remove the politics. The Ryan Garcia fight is a natural fight to make. I mean, Ryan should be looking to fight the champions at 140. He's on the zone, obviously, with Golden Boy. There's a conversation that, for me, should happen and evolve very quickly. You know, I think that is the fight for us and Golden Boy and Garcia and Haney to make. You've also got Teofimo Lopez. That becomes a lot more difficult because I think he may be unreasonable about his demands, but, you know, he's a great fighter as well. Tank, I just see these two, Bill and Tank, and, like, everybody's butting heads. For me, you want momentum. You want, you know, an ability to move swiftly to make a mega fight. And for me, that is a conversation really between ourselves, Golden Boy and DAZN, that should be fairly easy to maneuver. And I think it's a massive fight. So you just did uh, Munguia and uh, Ryder. So you guys are on good terms. Yeah. yeah. I mean, look, it, we're on good terms when it makes sense to everybody. Right. That's, that's the reality. You know, I don't think, you know, I'm in LA at the moment. I'm not sure I'm going to get a call from Oscar to pop around later for a a glass of red, but <laughs> ultimately, you know, I love, like, Mungia Ryder is such a good fight, such a good fight for everybody. It's the perfect fight. Mungia, you know, I think is at a, a poor CV of, of fights, really, but he's also a very good fighter. Ryder's coming off a good fight with Canelo Alvarez, and we fancy John Ryder in that fight. I really do. I think he's going to turn him over, but a really nice addition to the early part of the schedule in Mungia Ryder, and, you know, there's a lot more to add, but, yeah, when it works for everybody... We, we, you know, it, it happens, and particularly when you're on the same platform. So I believe talks with Garcia and Haney will open up in the next week. Okay, so I was just going to ask you, because uh, Oscar, as you know, tweeted literally minutes after the fight. Has anything happened since Saturday and now? No. no. Only, only obviously, to zone and you know, a few internal talks to say that's definitely a fight that we need to discuss ASAP. Is that a Vegas fight? Yeah, I mean, I think both guys. I mean, Ryan can sell. You know, Ryan can sell in Texas, Vegas, New York. For, but for me, yeah, seeing the success of obviously Ryan Garcia against Tank in Vegas and obviously Devin now with his ability to shift tickets, I, I think that's a Vegas fight. Um, not to get ahead of ourselves, but I was texting with the, the crew here on Saturday and I said, I wouldn't be surprised if in a couple of years he's fighting at 147. You just said 147 as well. Like, I feel like no one really said it, but I feel like Haney versus Crawford at some point could be a gigantic fight. Some I'm not going to name it. Some people said I was crazy for saying that. What do you think? What does Eddie Hearn think? Is that a possibility yeah, I, in the I next think, couple of years? Think, I think that you know, that extra weight, if you look at Devin in the ring on Saturday, he actually looked like the weight division above Regis Progre, and he was coming right. up in weight. So I think Devin would definitely not look out of sorts at 147. You see a lot of great fighters who the only way to get beat is to go outside of your comfort on the weight class. Obviously, Canelo against Bivol is a good example of that. I think Lomachenko as well, you know, particularly at 130, Lomachenko was a, a better fighter than he is at 135. You know, people as well, you know, well beyond that, moving up in weight, maybe even Inoue. That's what it's going to take for Inoue to go to, I don't know, maybe 126 to get beat. And, and I feel like Devin, I don't see anybody beating Devin at 140. And I think that, you know, once you start moving to 147, you're fighting some big guys. And Crawford is a big guy at 147. But, you know, Devin against Crawford, skill-wise, it's just an incredible matchup. You saw so many similarities between Devin and, for me, a young Floyd Mayweather. You know, the defensive skills, like I said, the calmness, the poise, the footwork. He's really good. And, and you know, listen, for me as a fight fan, fights like Devin Haney against Terence Crawford, you know, that that's the future of the sport. Although Crawford is at the back end, Devin's a young man. And we need those young lions that can come out and fight for this sport for the next two or three years. And give us the mega fights. Devin against Tiafimo, Devin against Ryan, Devin against Tank, Devin against Crawford. You know, he's, he's really the future. You know, uh, speaking of Ryan and, and Oscar, can I get your take on what happened two weeks ago in, in Houston? That was, I mean, it was, it was incredible theater for us fans. Somewhat awkward to watch, uh, especially the press conference with Bernard and, and Oscar. Uh, you've been in this game a long time. Have you ever seen anything that awkward between a star fighter and a promoter? I mean... It, it was definitely the most bizarre thing I've ever seen. I mean, that is 
you know, Brian Garcia is obviously their number one fighter. So that is really like me <laughs> standing behind Anthony Joshua at a press conference going, <laughs> you know, and then tweeting 48 hours before his fight saying that I'm concerned about the mental health of Anthony Joshua going into his fight. For me, that's almost like dangerous. How can you expect this kid to prepare properly, mentally? You know, you're questioning his, his mental state. That's not doing anything to help his mental state. You know, and I think these guys have just got to get in a room. I mean, listen, it's none of my business really, but surely you just get in a room. You either part ways and say, look, this is toxic and not good for anyone, or you say to each other, this has to stop. You know, we're going to be professional. We're going to be effective. We're going to be constructive till the end of our tenure and our partnership. But until then, you know, let's act accordingly. Or you say, guys, we're never going to see eye to eye. I think maybe we should look at a deal to, to move away, but... I can't believe, I mean, honestly, I've never seen anything like it. It's the most bizarre thing ever. And props to Ryan Garcia, because I thought he might lose to Duarte. I watched that press conference and I thought, how do you expect this kid to be focused on his fight when his own promoter is pulling faces behind his back and telling him he's mentally not in a good place 48 hours out? I mean, you know, so big props to Ryan Garcia. I think that was a really dangerous fight for him. Duarte, you know, he's not an elite guy, but he can punch and he's dangerous. And if you're not mentally switched on, you can lose that fight. So well done him. Uh, were you impressed with his performance or not so impressed? A lot of people online were critical of how he looked in that fight. Yeah, so so. I think, look, when you've got nothing to look, nothing to gain, really, in a fight like that, you know, it's, it's dangerous. Duarte can punch. If Ryan Garcia loses that fight, he's in a terrible position in his career. Or like, so that was a must-win fight, quite a dangerous fight. So, look, you know, he's just teamed up with Derek James. Ryan Garcia is a very good fighter, you know, and I know that when I speak internally to other fighters they give him props as well for being a good dangerous fighter so you know i think he's he's brilliant for the sport we've got you know we've got to keep fighters like that motivated we've got to keep them mentally in a good place keep them active and keep them in love with the sport and you know he's a he's a big big part of the future of boxing so we we should embrace that rather than try and you know make it make him fall out of love with particularly the business of the sport last time you were on the show we had a fiery debate over Anthony Joshua versus Francis Ngannou, clearly won by me uh, by virtue of the fact that he is not Anthony fighting Francis. So clearly he didn't want that smoke after he heard the debate uh, light went off in his head. Uh, why Why didn't you pursue that? Why didn't that become a reality? Because it seemed like you were very interested on that Monday. Yeah, I did. I, uh, you know, I reached out to Francis Ngannou's team and I said, just to let you know, we're we're up for the discussing the Francis Ngannou AJ fight. I never heard back from them. Wow. So I think probably really? knowing is knowing the business, I would say that probably Fury and Garnu is almost probably agreed for post Fury Usyk already. You know, or certainly, if I'm Francis and Garnu, there's only three things I'm doing: I'm fighting AJ Wilder or Fury. He'll feel like after that first fight he can beat Fury. You know, but there's no point. He can really lose to anybody in the top fifty at heavyweight. So you've got to cash in at this point. You know, and, and there's really only three fights that cash into the levels that he will want. So I guess, and you may know better, Francis Ngannou will fight in the PFL or wherever in spring, summer of 2024. And then he'll fight Tyson Fury at the end of this year. I, I, w I would think that would be the mindset of the team. Win or lose against Usyk? You think they just run it back yeah. regardless? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think, again, not knowing the ins and outs, but I would find I think everyone knows it's a two-fight deal with Fury Usyk. And I would think that there's probably one on the back end as well to rematch in Garner. Do you think Fury wins that fight against Usyk? Probably. I mean, I, I really believe he was quite a strong favorite, you know, pre and Um We don't really know physically where he's at. I mean, he's lucky that Usyk's not a puncher. You know, he's lucky that Usyk's a much smaller man because I think against a bigger guy, against a puncher, against a guy that can wrestle him on the inside, I think his confidence really wouldn't be there in a fight like that. So I do think Fury will win the fight, but I, you know, I, you certainly can't rule out Usyk. And, and we just don't know where he's at physically or mentally after a fight like that. He didn't look himself in that fight, but perhaps he was just ill-prepared. So back to AJ, why does he keep changing trainers and are you concerned about this? No, I mean, for this instance, we had six weeks notice. So because he hadn't had a fight scheduled, he was training with Ben Davison, I think, for three or four weeks. And we agreed the fight with Otto Wilde in six weeks out to go to Dallas to train there and then go to Saudi across, I don't know, 
14 hour flight or whatever it was. The preparation just wouldn't have worked. He was comfortable with Ben Davison. Ben Davison was in the corner for Tyson Fury when he fought Otto Wallin. And I think with AJ, you're not going to change anything too much about him at this point. It's more about the strategy, the game plan, and making sure he's mentally in a good place and, and happy. And he is. You know, he's training well. He's enjoying the link up with Ben Davison. Um, and it's a tough fight, Ariel, to be honest with you. You know, it's not... I think because all the conversations now about making AJ against Wilder, it's not the ideal fight to go into when that fight is at the finish line. And even from a stylistic point of view, why would you fight a six foot six Southpaw when you're hoping to fight Deontay Wilder in, in the spring? But it's a tricky fight, a dangerous fight, one that AJ should be winning, but he has to be switched on for it because we've been here before on the doorstep of the Deontay Wilder fight and got beat to Andy Ruiz. So, you know, I think this is definitely one that you breathe a sigh of relief when you come through, but I expect AJ to do a job on Otto Wilder and knock him out. Is that in writing? Meaning if both win on December 23rd, they'll fight each other? It's ongoing. I mean, I hope that, you know, post fight or on the night, we might be able to give you some, some news, but it's certainly the ambition of Saudi Arabia and his excellency to make, that fight, of course, you know, they're on the same card. It's one of the biggest fights, if not the biggest fight in boxing. But there's still some work to do. But the focus of the teams is to win on December 23rd. My job is to look at the future for Anthony Joshua and build a schedule for him for 2024. We all want that schedule to start with a number one, Deontay Wilder. But without victory for both of them on the day of reckoning, it actually is irrelevant. So both guys have got challenges next week. I can't believe it's next week. Yeah. And... Uh, you know, it's a massive night. Uh, you were asked about this on, uh, you were doing like an Instagram chat thing again. Not sure if it's you, because how the hell do you have the time to do always this? Always me. It's always you. It's unbelievable. No one, no one can log into my accounts. It's I shouldn't say that, just in case I need to blame someone. But, yeah, you know. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you said all will be revealed um, as far as Anthony. Do you remember writing this? All will be revealed. Someone asked you about... Yeah, I just said, like, we, you know, if we, if we win on December 23rd, all will be revealed. The plans will be revealed. And you know, I get asked all the time, is the Wilder AJ fight done? Is it signed? The answer is no. But, you know, things can move very quickly. And we all know that the reason these guys are on the card together is to work towards the biggest or one of the biggest fights in boxing. But nothing is, is uh, you know, nothing is signed yet. But, you know, there's a lot of conversations ongoing. We just want to make sure we secure victory next week against Otto Wilder. Does AJ Wilder have to be in the UK? No, I think, you know, there's a, it's almost certainly going to be no, in I the know. Middle East. If but, it's but, but you, you like, I get, I, I asked that question because I think it's fair to say when these fights are in the Middle East, as opposed to the market, which means the most to the A side, so to speak, it just feels different, right? It's not the same. AJ fighting in London, as opposed to Saudi will not feel the same. It will feel a little bit void of any buzz or hype. I mean, they could try their hardest. I, I, don't I know, know the money's you know, not the same. Be, I think, yeah, I think it'll be full up with Brits as well. But okay. at the same time, I get, I get what you're saying. You know, I think, look, this is an emerging market. And I, sometimes I get asked the question, you know, do you think it's good for boxing that boxing's being taken away from Las Vegas and, and London? It's like you do realize that there's this thing. It's called the world. <laughs> and it's not just Las Vegas and London. You know, our sport has the potential to grow well beyond our wildest dreams. And to do that, it's part of our you know, ethos behind our global strategy of taking boxing to key markets. The Middle East are a power player of sports. OK, they're enabling us to get fights to happen. Usyk against Fury, great example. I think without the Middle East, I don't think that fight would have happened. Maybe Wilder against Joshua, because, you know, people have got an idea of what that fight might be worth. So I don't think we can be naive enough to say, oh, you know, that that fight should be there, you know, when there's a chance to keep building. Like the atmosphere in Saudi Arabia is much better than it was when we went for its inception with Andy Ruiz's fight maybe three years ago. So the growth of the sport there and, and not just boxing, but all sports is leading to, you know, a, a better fan experience. And for me, if they're going to step up and make these great cards and these great fights then we've got to do it and obviously financially as you know Ariel you know it's it's a conversation between fighters and teams that's very difficult to ignore when a fight can get made can get made quickly and obviously the money is significant would you be open to doing Ben Eubank there 
Yeah, but, you know, I, I said at the same time, there is part of me as well that says UK is our, you know, our primary market. Like, we, I want to make sure that British boxing gets the big nights and the big fights. And for us, Ben Eubank is a fight that should happen in London, you know, should happen at Tottenham Hotspur. And I think I understand Fury Usyk and, you know, those, those real kind of mega, mega global fights, like the heavyweight undisputed championship. But when we can feel a stadium for Ben Eubank, when I know it can do 800 or a million pay-per-view buyers in the UK, it, it's, you know, it's too, that's a British fight. You know, the, the undisputed world championship has a global appeal for, for the Middle East that is just different. So for me, when we can, we need to keep fights like that in the UK. I, I think you said last week that, uh, I believe it was to the great Charlie Parsons of Boxing Social, uh, that that you said that uh, February 3rd was a, a date that Conor Ben really wanted to fight on and that the deadline was approaching. Have we passed the deadline for the Eubank fight that he made? You know, I, mean, I think um, the only person holding the fight up now is Eubank. And I don't like to say holding the fight up because he's got his number. Some somehow from somebody, and we we can't oh, hit this that is, number. This is what you were talking about. I saw your post fight interview. I watch everything, by the way. I saw your post fight interview with yes. Boxing Social, and you went on this long tangent about hanger honors calling up and making. This it is was, what you. Yeah, were, it wasn't. Was it, it the Eubank yeah, fight? It was, it's not some in relation to this incident, but just in general, area. Like just you know, and my example was, and not even in relation to the numbers of that fight, but you imagine how frustrating it is when you know you put a budget together, you know the numbers inside out. This fighter's value in the fight is $2 million. And then you pick up the phone to his advisor and he tells you it's $10 million or nothing. And it's like, you know, to put that into context, that's like going to buy a house that, you know, you put a value of. And, and all the experts, you know, the surveyors, everybody tells you that house, the market price for that house is $2.75 million. And you've got the owner going, unless you give me 10, I ain't buying. I'm not selling. And it's like, how did you get so – this is the frustrating thing with boxing where fighters want to pull numbers from the sky where they're getting that commercial advice from someone that has absolutely no knowledge of the numbers, no knowledge of the industry, no knowledge of the sport. And that is the bane of my life. The most frustrating part of my life is having to go through that process and try and have a sensible conversation with people that just don't get it. And that's why people, fighters particularly, are ill-advised but also – have big problems in terms of their activity. You know, Tiafimo Lopez is a great example of that. He probably thinks he should be getting 10 million for an easy voluntary defense. You know, look at the ticket sales, look at the numbers on ESPN. You might be able to get 2 million for an easy defense. Oh, I'm not doing that. Okay, well, sit out for a year then. You could have two fights, you could build your profile, you could start, you know, look at like the Devin Haney's this world. You think that people like Tiafimo Lopez would have flown to Australia? And for George Cambosis for three million dollars twice in five months, like it just—it's so frustrating that a fighter takes the wrong advice or doesn't listen to the right people. And I'm not saying you just have to listen to your promoter, but it—you know—you've got to stay active. It's the way to build a fighter's career. You've got so many great fighters in America; they could walk down their own street, and people wouldn't know who they are. They should be superstars, you know. Jerron Ennis is another guy we're talking to. Like, this guy, is, I think he could be pound for pound number one. Like, he, he should be an American superstar. Look at the job they did on Bud Crawford. Like, what is he now? 35, 36. He's only actually starting building his profile from the Spence fight. This is a pound for pound number one of our sport. A guy with personality, a guy with charisma, a guy with an incredible backstory from Omaha. And a guy that's been undisputed at 140 and 147. Walk him up and down the streets in the major cities. They won't know who he is. And, you know, you've got to stay active. You've got to. And it's just, it's frustrating sometimes, this sport. It really winds me up, but I love it. I, as do we. Uh, I, I want to ask uh, two follow-ups based on what you just said. Number one, you said we're talking to Jerome Ennis. What does that mean? Just to his, his father and his management team. I'd like to sign him. Is he a free agent? Yeah. That would be a nice one. Yeah. He's incredible. Lots, he's, he's an incredible fighter. But again, it's like it's getting them to understand we've got a job to do, you know, with Jerron Ennis. I need 12 months to build this kid into a superstar. You know, I need to take him home to Philadelphia, start filling out stadiums there. But when you've got a fighter as good as that, it's so easy to put a plan together because you know he can beat everybody. You know, it's a bit like Andy Cruz. 
you know, I can get in there on Saturday and just spiel for two minutes of absolute waffle to the world. Truth, but still waffle and my mouth going at motor speeds because I know how good this kid is. And I'm a salesman. And when I'm selling a product that is elite and second to none, no one can do the job that I can. And with Andy Cruz, I can get in there and I can speak passionately from the heart. And it's pure truth coming out of my mouth. This kid is unbelievable. I'd put him in with anybody at 135 now and really think we can win. And he's at, that was his second fight, you know? But you've got to have someone with that megaphone, that motor mouth, that machinery within their promotional and digital arsenary to push you 24-7. Who is pushing the profile of Boots Ennis? Who is getting on the microphone? I mean, I'm pushing his profile just by talking about him. I don't even, he's not even signed with us because I'm, I think he's brilliant. But you've got to have, especially when you're someone like Andy Cruz, who doesn't yet speak English particularly well, he's from Cuba, you need that megaphone. You need someone telling the world this kid is special. And that's so easy to do with people like Boots Ennis because he's American. He's, you know, he looks great. He's got style. He's got power. He's got speed. And I know that you can put him in fights at 147 where you, you, you just go in and say, do your thing. So, yeah. I don't know. Nothing's ever perfect, but that's my thoughts. Uh, you and Andy Cruz on Saturday, that was you at your finest. You getting on, the, yeah. you cut that promo in the ring. That that was you at your best. And we don't have that in MMA. It's not really a thing to have the promoter talking. I, I love all mm. that stuff. And then you on the Instagram live with Keyshawn Davis afterwards. <laughs> How, like, a high-profile fight for Andy Cruz, he's only, as you said, two pro fights in. How close are we to that? Like, is this the is it same, same like David Morell? Something about these Cuban boxers. Yeah, oh, very good. Listen, Morell's brilliant. Yeah. Don't represent him. What a fighter. Might be the best at 168. You know, I mean, that's a tremendous fighter. And Andy Cruz, the same. So, but the problem with David Morell is, see, a problem with a lot of these organizations, they don't really want this guy out there just, well, you know, like, PBC don't like to promote their fighters. <laughs> what do you they mean? Don't by have what do you mean by that? Who, who is the promoter, right? Of PBC can't be Al Heyman apparently because no. that's you. That uh, you know a breaking of the the Ali Act. He's an advisor. So who is the promoter? Like you need to be up there on the stage talking about these guys, talking about David Morrell. You need someone going out across his platforms, across every media interview with a big megaphone saying David Morrell is the best at 168. He'll fight anybody now and beat anybody. But instead, you've got a guy that, you know, doesn't really speak a lot of English. That's like just everybody in boxing, which is a tiny, tiny audience, knows how good David Morrell is. And they already know how good Andy Cruz is. How do we convince the, the average casual fan to tune in to Andy Cruz. Well, someone, hopefully, across my following or whoever's platforms, my speech on Saturday was good enough to reach millions across different platforms. And someone go, wow, who is this kid? I need to check him out. But without me doing that, you know, like I got in the ring, I said to Chris Mannix after, I don't even think they wanted me to speak. I said, you need to ask me a question. I need to speak. <laughs> Because that's how my, I was, my heart was beating out of my chest. The hairs were standing up on my arms. If to say, wow, we've got something special. Let me speak. I need to tell the world. So some people will look at it and say, oh, here he goes again. That's my job. You, As a fighter, you need a machine behind you 24-7, particularly if you're not that guy, you know, who's going to sit and do Instagram lives and talk. You know, Keyshawn's great. Keyshawn's not with us, but I like him. But I tease him because obviously Andy Cruz, I think, fought him four times in the amateurs and like he couldn't he could never get anywhere near beating him and i know the program's different but this kid andy cruz mate oh he was unbelievable he was unbelievable mm. i was watching that with my wife and she was like holy crap she doesn't know anything about <laughs> boxing and she's like this guy is insane second fight yeah unbelievable like, and now we look to hopefully we'll, we'll confirm edgar belanga's fight in february and we want him in that co, co main event slot get him a top 15 guy but i can't it's not even going to be competitive. Like the only way it's going to be competitive is him against Shakur or Tank or like these kind of guys. So we just, so with that promotion on Saturday, with his performance and with me spieling in the ring after, that's his second fight. You build a fighter from the ground up. That's the difficulty with a Crawford or an Ennis. You're, you're getting hold of a fighter who's what, 
28, 30, whatever he is. And, oh, I needed Jerron Ennis five years ago. Mm. It'd be like Floyd Mayweather would be selling out everywhere in, around around the US. But it's okay. We can get him now. But there's still a job to do. But with Andy Cruz, that was his second fight. Watch the hype around Andy Cruz for fight three and four and five. And then we might have a Cuban fighter who is actually headlining in America and he's his own star. You know, so it's a method behind the madness. Uh, you have time for a couple more. I know I'm taking a lot of your time here. Oh, oh, um, I just want to go back to Ben Eubank. You said that Eubank was holding it up. How is he the only one holding it up when the British board is still, you know, causing problems here? Does that mean you would be I mean, open to taking this to the PDA? To do, we, we've decided to do this fight. You know, Callis Howland, who is Chris Eubank Jr.'s promoter, is not licensed by the British Boxing Board of Control. I'm not going to stand in the way of this fight happening. You know, this is Conor Benny's went for his case with the board. He won his case. He's not suspended. He had that lifted. He's clear to fight. Now, the board are going to appeal. When that is, we don't know. But until that moment, and by the way, he'll win the appeal anyway, but he's not suspended. He's clear to fight. That's why he was allowed to fight in Orlando. So it gets quite boring. But if we get that fight made, and it's probably 48 hours away from being dead, that fight will go ahead in the UK. And it will be with PBA? Who knows? And does, hopefully with a British boxing, hopefully with a British boxing board of control. Because you have said in the past that it, it would re- affect your relationship if you if it's viewed as you trying that's to why, circumvent. That's why I might. That's why I might have to take a backseat in terms of the actual promotion, not wow. the promotion, but you know, we'll see. We'll see. Listen, in an ideal world, we want that fight with a British boxing oh, board of control. There's, there's a lot going on behind the scenes. Eddie, but I mean, talk I'm sport. Not, talk sport is going to do forty thousand hours of f- content on this alone if I'm, you do this. I mean, that's it's going to be a massive fight, Ariel. No, 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 no. If you go with PBA or something, you know they're going to be talking. It I, I don't listen. It's exhausting. At the end of the day, we it's it's a lot. It's a big decision for us. We will always back the British boxing board of control, but I will also do what I believe is right and fair, and I'm not seeing this opportunity for British boxing or for Conor Ben passing by if, if, if Chris Eubank decides to take the fight. Okay. But I've already made, we've already made the decision. We are not standing in the way of Conor Ben accepting this offer and making this fight. It's the biggest fight in British boxing. It's nearly, it will be nearly two years since he's boxed in Britain. The whole thing is madness. He's been through all the procedures asked of him. He's won his case with the WBC, got cleared, won his case with UK. It's boring to keep talking about it, but okay. he's not suspected. He's clear to fight, and we're doing everything we can to make that fight, but we'll see how Mr. Eubank feels today. Okay. Um, speaking of WBC, what did you make of Amanda Serrano giving up her WBC belt? She said it was because they didn't want to do 12 three-minute rounds. Uh, you have Sky Nicholson. She's on the doorstep, interim champion, and now it looks like that fight isn't going to happen. What did you make of that decision? Were you surprised? Yeah, I'm surprised because, you know, there's a huge value to being undisputed. And, you know, bizarrely, you know, you Sky's a regular on your show. She said four or five fights ago, I want to fight Amanda Serrano. You know, she's the undisputed champion. She's a legend of the sport. Like all fighters, they should be chasing the best in the division. But she said to me and Ibox and Paul Reddy, she won't fight me. And I sort of laughed at the time. I said, look, you've had five fights. Like, you know, you're not really knocking people out yet. And of course she'll fight you. She, I don't believe she will. They won't like my style. They'll know boxing and they'll know that my style is difficult. And lo and behold, she was actually correct. You know, Amanda Serrano vacated the title just before she knew she was about to get ordered to fight Sky Nicholson. So I think it's it's hard to say, you know, oh, she dropped the belt or ducked Sky Nicholson because of what she's achieved in the sport. But styles make fights. And maybe she just felt like that's a dangerous fight and it's not as big as the fights that I could be in. So, you know, for Sky now, she's fighting Sarah Marfood for the vacant title, but she won't stop chasing Amanda Serrano. You know, if she wins the WBC, then she could fight Serrano for undisputed. But um, it's great that she's challenging for the title, but in all honesty, her dream was to fight Serrano. She just believes she can beat her, and there's a lot of people that don't, but she was right. She vacated the title rather than facing her. Would you be okay with her fighting 12 three-minute rounds? Yeah, it's up to every fighter. I mean, you know, I I think it actually suits the better boxer. You know, over two minutes, it's just crash, bang, wallop. You know, it's like the the rounds are so hard to score. I think the purer boxer is going to control the rounds. The pace is actually going to be a little bit slower. I have to say, commercially, I like two minutes. 
Like, it's all action. I mean, we had Ebony Bridges against Yoshida on Saturday. It wasn't the most highest of standards that you've seen from Taylor and Cameron, but it was crash, bang, wallop, two minutes of just nonstop action. And that's really helped us engage the audience because it's been so entertaining. I'm not sure it would be as entertaining over three minutes. Mm. I think the pace would slow down. Maybe you might get more stoppages, but mentally for a fighter, oh, I've got longer rounds here. You know, I need to pace myself a little bit. You come out for two minutes and crash, bang, wallet. But I also do feel like it's important to keep evolving women's boxing and women's sport. So I don't really, I think whatever the governing bodies decide, the fighter will honour. But obviously the WBC are 10 twos. And if you want to fight for that prestigious belt, that's that's the uh, the rules of the governing body. Chantal Cameron came out over the weekend saying, okay, I want it. I, I took my time off. I want the trilogy. Is that what is going to happen? Katie versus Chantel, three next. Uh, I, I, I won't I was, even ask you about Croke Park. Yeah, I was really pleased to see that because, you know, everyone always feels like they're a little bit hard done by, you know, could have been a knockdown, could have been this. I'm not coming back to Ireland. And, and once the dust settles, you start realizing, well, actually, you won the first fight and you got the decision. You lost the second fight and you didn't get the decision. And, you know, you've, you've really achieved two huge paydays, huge moments for your career, incredible nights to be a part of. We can do this again in a trilogy outdoors, maybe at Croke Park, maybe at Aviva, whatever. But it's going to be another monumental event for Irish boxing. And I'm just glad Chantel's come back and, you know, she's a very stubborn competitor, very driven. And when she watches it back, she'll know she or think she can do better. And she'll want to run it back for number three. And I'm glad she did. So hopefully everyone's, again, sensible, which I think they will be. They can make a lot of money and we can have another iconic event for the sport. Is Katie down with that? For sure. For sure. You know, there's only really two fights, you know, Chantel Cameron and and Amanda Serrano. But I think Chantel Cameron is the bigger fight, you know, two tremendous fights. And it's the trilogy, 1-1. Any status on the talks with Croak? Ongoing. Let's just, we won't rub anyone up the wrong way. We're all working to try and make history. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, again, if we just adapted common sense to everything in boxing, we'd all be in a better place. But, you know, hopefully it it would be unbelievable. And just be great to give people better access. You know, when you're in 9,000 and you've got hit X on a gate, the tickets are expensive. You know, here we can open it up. You can see children, grandmothers, grandparents. It would be such an iconic event for Irish history. We'll see. We'll do everything we can. Ideal month for the fight? Realistic? Anywhere re- between April and July. I mean, whatever suits the government, tourism department, you know, whatever they think will, will add additional value. Okay, last one. Uh, and thank you, as always, for the time. And by the way, congratulations on the big win Saturday morning against uh, Frank Smith. I don't know oh. how you're... I mean, how, how, what are you running? Like a five-minute mile? I don't know what's going on over there. Yeah, yeah. I'm still recovering. I, it, it was, you know, zero ability, 100% heart. <laughs> aerial life. I've you seen know, your if, photos. If Oh my God, if I actually had ability, <laughs> I could I could have really achieved in life. But, you know, the well, effort gets you so far. Can we get you on VADA? I mean, I'm seeing your photos and it's uh <laughs> it's getting a little it's getting it's getting into Dana White don't. territory, by the way, in terms of I know. it's crazy. You know, if I post something or my trainer posts something, like the response are just like needles and you definitely don't have to worry about me being on a performance enhancing drugs, don't worry. Oh natural. Oh uh, natural. Um, there's a massive UFC card on Saturday. It's their final show of the year, UFC 296. Why should fans have the second screen up? I love Sonny Edwards. He, he's he's a fun follow on Twitter. Sometimes I feel like he engages too much with the trolls on Twitter, but he's a great character. Yeah. And this is a great uh, undisputed flyweight title fight. Why should they have the two screens up and watch the zone? Sonny Edwards, Bam because Rodriguez. You, you like your boxing. It doesn't really get any better than this. Boxing's all about, sport's all about, really, the best be the best. So this is number one and number two. I don't know in which order of the flyweight division. Two smaller guys that aren't going to have the profile of the heavyweights, but will give you the best be the best. It's a unification fight. Sonny is an enigma. Bam is an incredible talent. I said earlier, this fight, you know, Sonny could win every round on Saturday or he could get stopped in six rounds. I've, I've no idea what is going to happen, but it's elite versus elite, champion versus champion. And, and that's what sport's all around. So definitely have your screen on for a good night of boxing along with our friends at the UFC as well. Looking forward to it. Thank you, as always. Congrats on the deal that you're about to announce in a couple hours. Really appreciate okay. it, Eddie. We're late. All right. Okay, bye-bye. Take Good care. Night. Cheers. There he is, Eddie Hearn. Thanks for watching. We appreciate it very much. Hey, if you like this video, 
Give us the old thumbs up. Subscribe as well. You can get many more of these videos on the channel. So please do that. We would love you forever if you did so.